professional wrestling neck injuries. Who got them, how did it happen, and what did it mean for their careers in the future? Stay tuned to find out and see if I cover your favorite wrestling. Hey everybody, Dr. Chris, orthopedic surgeon and sports medicine physician. Welcome to my channel, your number one source for information on orthopedic injuries and broken bones that's easy to understand for everybody. So today we're talking about neck injuries in professional wrestling. And before we get started, I have to say that this is not covering any particular promotion, WWE, WWF, ECW, or what have you. This is covering injuries from a number of different promotions. And if I missed an injury to your favorite wrestler, don't get triggered. Let me know that in the comments and I'll cover it in another video. And finally, if you enjoyed the video and you like what I'm putting down, be sure to share this with somebody that you know, because after all, sharing is caring. The first injury that we're gonna talk about comes from a match between Chris Benoit and Sabu. And this is from an ECW promotion, November to Remember in 1994. And in this match, Benoit attempts to throw Sabu from an overhead press, but somehow miscalculates. When he throws Sabu, Sabu inadvertently lands on his head, subsequently fracturing his neck. And if we look at the video, we can see that Sabu lands on his head with his neck in forward flexion with some degree of lateral bending. Fortunately, Sabu is able to move and he rolls himself out of the ring. With some assistance, he is able to be taken backstage. Sabu was reported to have fractured his neck with this injury. It was difficult to find any specific information on the injury that Sabu suffered. However, based on the injury mechanism, one might assume that he would have suffered a flexion type of fracture of his cervical spine. Generally speaking, flexion fractures cause an injury which is known as a flexion teardrop fracture of the cervical spine. And these fractures are extremely unstable and generally require surgical treatment. However, there are some types of flexion fractures such as a C2 teardrop which are relatively stable and can be treated conservatively or non-operatively. Given that I could not find any specific information on surgeries that Sabu had undergone, I'm going to assume that he was treated non-operatively for a relatively stable fracture. At any rate, Sabu was eventually able to return to wrestling after an adequate period of rehabilitation. He wrestled in a number of different promotions and subsequently re-fractured his neck in a match against Taz in 1998. On this occasion, he was injured after receiving a Tazplex through a table and subsequently landing incorrectly. He apparently returned to wrestling only two weeks later while wearing a neck brace, which also leads me to believe that this fracture, if it indeed was fractured, was relatively minor. In other words, it likely only involved a transverse process or an element of the spine that was non-structural. Either way, I think it's a little bit crazy to be returning to wrestling after having suffered an injury such as this in only two weeks. That's madness. But I guess that's why these guys are professional wrestlers. The second injury that we're gonna be talking about comes from a match between Brock Lesnar and Kurt Angle. And this injury occurred during WrestleMania 19 in 2003. In this match, while Kurt is laying in the middle of the ring, Brock attempts a shooting star press off the top rope. Unfortunately for Brock, he failed to complete the full rotation on the backflip, subsequently landing on his head, the top of his head, all 350 pounds of him. Amazingly, he was able to continue the match. Fortunately for Brock, the gods were with him on this particular day because he did not suffer a neck injury, but he did suffer concussion as a result of this botched move. And if we look at the video, we can see that he actually struck the mat with his forehead rather than the top of his head, which is probably what actually saved him. The next injury that we're gonna cover comes from a match between Triple H and Marty Garner. And this match occurred during WWF Superstars in 1996. In this particular case, the injury occurred near the end of the match. And at this point, Triple H attempted to end the match with a move called the Pedigree Finisher. Garner apparently mistook the move for a double underhook suplex and he attempted to jump up into the air while the move was being performed. The extra pop while the move was being performed caused Marty to land on the top of his head, which subsequently resulted in a neck injury. 
As his arms were trapped by the pedigree finisher, he was not able to protect his head on the way down using his arms. The exact injury that Garner suffered has not been described, but it appears that he was able to be treated non-operatively. And if we assume that this injury was treated non-operatively, then this rules out any unstable cervical fractures, or in other words, any unstable fractures of the cervical spine or the neck. Given the axial load that was applied to the cervical spine without flexion, extension, or rotation, one can assume a compression fracture of the cervical vertebrae or an injury to the intervertebral discs. Garner apparently continues to suffer from persistent pain symptoms in his neck, suggesting that there is likely an element of degenerative disc disease in his cervical spine. Garner sued the WWE for his injury and he agreed to an out of court settlement. The next injury that we're gonna talk about comes from a match between Dragon Lee and Hiromu Takahashi. This injury occurred from NJPW promotion on July 7th of 2018. And on this date, Hiromu Takahashi was defending his title against Dragon Lee at the G1 special show in San Francisco. At the moment that Hiromu was injured, Dragon Lee attempted to perform a suplex on Hiromu. Unfortunately, Dragon Lee botched the maneuver and launched Hiromu onto the top of his head, subsequently causing a flexion injury to Hiromu's neck. Amazingly, Hiromu was able to finish the match and walk out of the arena under his own power, but he subsequently collapsed backstage. Although he was able to sit up and communicate, he found it very difficult to move, and he was subsequently taken to the hospital for examination. After a physical examination and radiographic imaging, he was subsequently released from the hospital that same evening. He was able to fly back to Japan the following day. In an interview, he recalls a moment of temporary paralysis immediately after the injury, but states that his loss of sensation and motor function quickly resolved. Based on the mechanism of injury and his described symptoms, it is possible that he suffered a phenomenon called Lermite's phenomenon. Lermite's phenomenon is an uncomfortable electrical sensation that runs up and down the spine and into the limbs. This sensation travels through the back and down the spine. It is caused by compression of the upper cervical spine or lower brainstem. The exact injury that Hiromu suffered has not been disclosed, but he was eventually able to return to wrestling. He did so more than a year later in December of 2019 and then again in January of 2020. The next injury that we're going to talk about is to a wrestler named Jesse Sorensen. The injury occurred on February 12, 2012 during a TNA promotion between Jesse Sorensen and Zima Ion. The injury occurred during a number one contenders match on the Against All Odds promotion. A few minutes into the match, Zima Ion performed a moonsault onto Jesse Sorensen who was outside of the ring. Sorensen was struck in the head by Ion's legs and he immediately fell to the ground, immediately. Sorensen was helped out of the arena and immediately taken to the hospital for further examination. He was reported to have suffered a C1 vertebral fracture with spinal cord edema. And this is significant because C3, 4, and 5 keep the diaphragm alive. And this just means that the nerve roots at the C3, C4, and C5 level are the ones that control the movement of your diaphragm and your diaphragm is what allows you to breathe. Injuries that occur at or above those levels are quite severe because they carry with them the possibility of loss of control of your diaphragm. And that just means the inability to breathe independently. If you don't die from these, then you may need a machine to breathe for you for the remainder of your life. Fortunately for Jesse, his injury was relatively stable and did not require operative fixation. He was treated for an extended period of time with cervical immobilization, meaning that he was placed in a rigid collar to hold his spine in place while the fractures healed. This type of treatment is possible for stable fractures of the C1 vertebrae. Unstable fractures, on the other hand, require prolonged cervical traction or a C1 to C3 fusion. And this just basically means that you need to pull upwards on the skull to keep it immobilized for an extended period of time 
or you need to make an incision and put plate and screw fixation to fuse three of the vertebrae together to provide stability of the cervical spine after this type of injury. I felt the initial hit and then I just blacked out. When I woke up on the floor, uh I remember Brian Stifler was uh, asking me, he's like, hey, you know, I'm gonna count you out, you gotta get up. Although he was released by TNA, after healing, Sorensen was able to return to wrestling. He subsequently retired in 2014. He came out of retirement and returned to wrestling for a number of independent promotions, but has only wrestled a few times since. The last injury that we're gonna talk about is to a wrestler named Hayabusa. Hayabusa is a WEW wrestler who was injured during a match on October 22nd of 2001. And during this match, he attempted to perform a springboard moonsault off the second rope, but apparently lost his footing. He landed on his head, causing the fracture of two cervical vertebrae and resulting in immediate paralysis. His injury was severe and required operative management with surgical stabilization. Hayabusa was not able to walk for 14 years. He did regain some control of his lower extremities and he was eventually able to walk with a cane and assistance in 2015. Unfortunately for Hayabusa, he died one year later as a result of a subarachnoid hemorrhage at the age of only 47. It is not clear what caused the subarachnoid hemorrhage, but I suspect that it is unrelated to his previous cervical spine injury. So clearly we can see that neck injuries are relatively common in professional wrestling. And given the theatrics and the acrobatics that are a part of professional wrestling, it should come as no surprise that this is indeed the case. And while I probably only just scratched the surface, today we've talked about a number of injuries of varying severity from several different wrestling promotions. If I've missed your favorite wrestler or your favorite wrestling promotion, be sure to let me know in the comment section down below and I'll cover it in another video in the future. And as always, that's been a word from Dr. Chris, not your everyday ortho. Just a flesh wound.